the vine and the branches. I don't know about you, but growing up, I struggled with this passage. I mean, I never worked in a vineyard. I never picked grapes. I've never made wine. I never really understood the analogy. I think it was lost on me. And furthermore, when you look at the verbiage in this passage, my goodness, the verbiage in this passage is, seems to be about being cut off. If you're not a branch that produces enough fruit, are you cut off? Maybe God will cut you off. Could that happen to you as a believer? I mean, these are important questions, right? And yet for me, growing up, I would look at this passage and hear dozens of sermons on it throughout my life, and it meant so very little. I knew I was supposed to glean something about connection with Christ, and maybe it's supposed to be His power, but the whole analogy, it just fell short for me. I was afraid of being cut off. I was wondering, how is this passage freeing? You said the truth will set me free. I read this, and I'm just not so sure. I become a fruit inspector. I get worried about whether I'm producing enough fruit. And then he talks about me being apart from him. Apart from him? Am I ever apart from him? Do I have to worry about being apart from him and doing nothing? Maybe I'm not the only one. Here we are in West Texas, and did you know we have vineyards here? I didn't really know that, but many cotton farmers have exchanged their cotton for grapes. Uh, we have a vineyard known as Newsom Vineyards, not too far from here. We have High Plains Wine Growers Association. And in fact, there are a number of vineyards around the Lubbock area, and yet still, I would imagine that the average person in Lubbock County knows very little about making wine and picking grapes in a vineyard and the process that it takes to cultivate and care for each plant. And so here we are in John 15 and Jesus says, I am the true vine and every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does he do with it? Well, he prunes it. He cleans it. Now, it seems that uh, our text is missing some of the, the verses here, but uh, fortunately, I came prepared. Uh, so, if we can get that working, great. But the, the passage begins this way. Jesus says, I'm the vine. I'm the vine. A Christ connection. That's what he wants for us. A Christ connection. And maybe that's what we've got. He announced himself as the vine. And then he talks about branches not bearing fruit. And who takes care of that? The Father. And so as we look at this passage today, we see some controversial verbiage. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Some translations say cut off and clean well, the clean is correct here. He does clean because in the next verse he says, he says, all of you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So clearly this word prunes means cleans. But in the previous verse, what we see, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts off? I don't think so. You look at the original language and there are several other definitions for this word. This verb can mean to lift up, to support, to raise. And that's exactly what vine growers do here in West Texas, in California and around the world. We take something that is struggling and we lift it up. That's what he's talking about in this passage. The care of the Father, the care of Jesus. To take something that's hurting and not get rid of it, not cut it off, but lift it up to make a place for it, to be sure that it grows. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken. I wonder if we Christians need to hear this. It seems like we need to hear this. Because when the Son of God himself 
tells you that you're clean, maybe, just maybe, you ought to pay attention. And yet, a lot of the church today, it seems like we're still begging and pleading and hoping and waiting for more cleansing. Sound familiar? The idea that you fall in and out of God's good grace, the idea that you need more cleansing and need more forgiveness and need to stay in God's will and you better not fall out. And we have become, as a church globally, we have become neurotic. Neurotic about getting something that we've already got. Jesus is announcing this early. He's saying, you are already clean. It'll be true because of the cross and the resurrection, but Jesus has authority to forgive sins. He has authority to announce this, and He's announced it to you. Do you realize that the Son of God is saying to you, right here, right now, you are already clean? You don't need to get clean. You don't need to hope to be clean. You don't need to try to get more cleansing. You are already clean. Now we get to the very interesting part, this command. And it is a command, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. This has been turned into a work. For many, me growing up, I remember reading this passage and reading books about this passage and hearing sermons about this passage and thinking that then it was my job to go away as a Christian and try to find the victorious life. Try to find the higher life through abiding. Try to get to a loftier life by doing something called abiding. Even one translation says remain. Oh boy, i got to wake up and try to remain? How am I going to remain in Christ? I thought I was already in Christ. You just said I'm already clean. How do I remain? How do I abide? Have you heard a sermon? Maybe you have. A message about abiding that made it seem far off and lofty. And it was the deeper life and the greater life and the better life. And it was called something and you were to pursue it and chase it. You were to try to abide. And yet the word abide means live, doesn't it? We abide here in West Texas. We make our abode in this incredible state known as Texas. We're already here, amen? You don't need to try to get in Texas if you're already in Texas. And by the way, everything is bigger in Texas. But you're already here. You don't need to try to get here. This morning, you're in church without religion. You don't need to try to get to the building. You're in the building. But even more so, we abide, we live in this state, in this county, in this city. We live here, we don't need to try to get here. And you say, okay, well if that's true, if abide just means live, then why is it a command? Because some people will argue, no, it's an ongoing command, so you need to wake up on Monday and try to abide, and wake up on Tuesday and try to abide. Well, it's a command because this relationship really hasn't happened yet. Where does it occur? At Pentecost. This is before the cross. It's before the resurrection. It's before Pentecost. It's before the vine and branches relationship is a reality. And so you can see Jesus sitting on a rock surrounded by Jews. And he is telling them about a future relationship. And he's saying, live in me. And they're saying, yeah, but you're right here in front of us. What are you talking about? Live in me. Yeah, but you're seated six feet away from me. Live in me. It's a future relationship that would take shape at Pentecost. They were told to wait for power from on high, right? That's because that sort of connection had never been experienced before. My point is this, have you responded to the command? Oh, it's a command, abide in me and I in you. Have you responded to that? Well, if you have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, then guess what? You no longer abide in Adam, you abide in Christ. You no longer abide in the flesh, you abide in the Spirit. You have responded 
to this command, and now Christ lives in you. Context. It's important. Without the proper context, you just have a con. And I'm telling you that we've been conned. We've been conned not by people who wanted to con, but we've been conned by the idea, the very human and religious idea, that we need to get what we've already got. You're already abiding. There is no higher life. You're raised and seated. There is no deeper life. You're in Christ. It doesn't get any deeper. You don't need to go deeper or higher or loftier or better. We are complete. We have everything we need for life and godliness. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Are you of yourself? Are you by yourself? Not any longer. You're one spirit with the Lord. He did it. He took you out of Adam and hoisted you across a great chasm and placed you in Christ and made you one spirit with Him, joined to Jesus forever, so you're never by yourself. No, a branch can't bear fruit of itself, but you're not by yourself. You're in Him. Apart from Christ, I'm an empty shell of a man, but I'm never apart from Christ. And so we see the context here, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. And so these Jews, they know nothing of abiding. All they know is self-effort. They've been taught. They've watched the Pharisees beat their chests. They've seen the 613 commands of the law. They've looked at relating to God as a self-improvement program, a religious cleanup system. That's all they know. And then here's this Jesus talking about vine and branches and connection and intimacy and closeness and drawing life from someone else. It's got to seem mystical. I mean, this is the same guy who's teaching eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Somebody's thinking this guy is a barbarian. And now he's saying live from me, live from you. Yeah, but you're seated right over there. This doesn't make sense. Yeah, I got to go, and then I'll come again. But I got to go in order to come and live in you. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, apart from me, you can do nothing. So again, we've seen this command. It's here twice. Abide in me. Abide in me. Live in me. It's here twice, but there's a contrast in both cases. In the first case, it's either abide or live by yourself. Now, it is abide or live apart from Him and you can do nothing. Do you ever live apart from Him? No, He's taken care of this. You don't live apart from Him ever. You're always in Him. I mean, the promises of Jesus jive with this perfectly I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Even when you are faithless, I remain faithful. Nothing separates us from the love of Christ. Given all those promises, can you say that on Monday you're with Him and Tuesday you're apart from Him and Wednesday you're with Him and Thursday you're apart from Him? This is not Jesus' meaning. He is not inviting us to torture. He is not, God is not an absentee father. He is not one who divorces us. We say all the time, God hates divorce. And then we imagine that he might divorce us. Do we see the irony? He cannot disown himself and he lives in you. So he'll never disown you. Apart from me, you can do nothing but thank God... You're never apart from Him. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch. On which day? Is it Wednesday when I messed up because I wasn't abiding? Is it Thursday when I failed to rest enough? Is it Friday when I didn't reach the higher life, the abiding life? Do you see how this doesn't fit? All of a sudden, we're in a dilemma. Are you a branch that is going to be burned? I don't think so. There is no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? So who is it that is thrown away? The unbeliever. Therefore, follow this, who is it that doesn't abide in him? An unbeliever. Because you always abide in him. This is black and white. It is night and day. It is clear as a bell. And it is not meant to be confusing. If anyone doesn't live in me, they live in Adam. And there's punishment for that. There remains a wrath that they're under. God doesn't want that for them. God didn't put them under it. They chose it. We chose it in the garden. In the day you eat of this, you will surely die. And God was saying, please don't die. And we said, yeah, but I want to check this out anyway. And we chose death. And we put ourselves under wrath. And so the consequence of that state is ultimately not to be celebrated, but to be thrown away as a branch. Some say destroyed, which is a merciful thing. But the point is this, it is so clear. It is black and white, no gray area. You abide in Adam, you abide in Christ. It's one or the other. And we as believers are never thrown away as a branch. They gather them, they cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Whoa. So, Jesus has painted a picture, right? He's painted a picture of punishment or glory. Of life in Adam or life in Christ. Life apart from Jesus or life in Jesus. And we have to locate ourselves in this passage. Because we Christians, I mean, you talk about a neurosis. We want to put ourselves in every verse. Oh, that's me. I'm that servant. And I'm the good servant. Well, no, wait, I'm, sometimes I'm the wicked servant. And sometimes, oh, wait, the gnashing of teeth. No, I couldn't be the wicked servant. Well, you know, maybe he's just going to need to polish my teeth. You see what we're doing? We're trying to put ourselves in every parable, in every verse, in every passage, and we look through a grid of condemning religion, and we end up making abide into a work when it simply means to live. If you abide in me, this is interesting, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Anybody tried that lately? How's that going for you? There was a guy on Facebook, not Facebook, but YouTube, a well-known preacher, not a good one, and I say that with confidence. But I mean, he was speaking away the virus and casting away the virus, and then they put his casting away to some rock music, and you can check it out on YouTube. It's fairly entertaining and fairly sad at the same time. He was casting and speaking and talking to the devil and using Jesus' name. And this was like in March. And here we are in November with egg on our face, using the name of Jesus, barking at Satan, barking at who knows what, trying to command things around. And you say, well, then what does this passage mean? Well, if you look... At John 14, the previous chapter gives us, again, a little context. He specifically says, if you ask in my name. And here, he is saying, you ask with my words in you. We ask with Jesus' words in us. What does that mean? You know, the United Nations, they, they meet in Geneva, Switzerland. Every once in a while, they'll meet in New York, and they'll meet in Switzerland, and they'll meet in other cities around the world. But I I want you to imagine that you get the opportunity to represent the United States at the United Nations in Geneva. And so the president uh, decides to give you a manila folder, and inside that manila folder is all of his agenda, and you're the ambassador, you're the communicator, you're the one. And so you study this hard for a few days, a few weeks, and then you get on that airplane and you head over there and you're ready to represent the president of the United States in Geneva. How exciting. But on the plane ride over, you get second thoughts. 
And then you get third thoughts. And you start getting your own thoughts. And then you start scribbling down your own ideas. And by the time that plane lands, you have written so much in the margin that you've now got your own message and your own agenda and your own word. And that's what you present in Geneva. You are no longer speaking in the name of the president, are you? You're speaking in your own name. You don't have his words that you're proclaiming. These are your words. And friends, this is why we can't take a passage like this out of context and just say, well, I'm going to tack Jesus' name on to the end of any prayer, and it ought to be like a wish list. I mean, it ought to be like a genie in a bottle. In Jesus' name, give me a mansion. In Jesus' name, give me a Lamborghini. In Jesus' name, I speak this virus away. And then it doesn't happen, and people are disappointed and disillusioned, and they're wondering what went wrong. I guess I want us to go back to the Apostle Paul for a minute and ask, what did he pray? What did he pray with authority? What did he pray globally for the whole church? What did he pray with confidence? He prayed things like, I pray that your eyes will be open. I pray that your eyes will see how big the love of Jesus Christ is. You know why he could pray something like that? That you would be strengthened in the inner man because of the knowledge of God's love, God's great love for you. He knew he could pray that with confidence and that it was inspired and belonged in Scripture because that is praying in Jesus' name. That is praying with Jesus' agenda, with the heart of Jesus. He wants us to know his love. In fact, as we finish this passage, guess what the topic is? Love. Love. So if you live in me and my words live in you, ask whatever you wish from the perspective of my words in my name and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. You know, I guess I thought fruit bearing was about me. Fruit bearing is about how good I am, right? I mean, fruit bearing is about me being a strong Christian. Fruit bearing is about my reputation. Fruit bearing is about my development. Fruit bearing is about how I'm doing. Well, apparently, fruit bearing is the Father's agenda. Remember, He's the vine dresser. He's the one lifting up. He's the one pruning, cleaning, lifting up. He's the one supporting. He's the one out in the field caring. Like, this is His agenda, The Bible even says that we walk in good works that God prepared in advance that we would just walk into them. I like to say they're like bowling pins. You wake up 7.30 in the morning, you're getting ready for your day. God's setting up bowling pins for you to walk into. Good work, number one. Good attitude, number two. Good perspective, number three. Good idea, number four. And he sets them up like bowling pins And then we, kind of like toddlers, just sort of toddle right into them. He prepares them in advance that we could walk right into them. It's his agenda. It's about him. It's for his glory. I mean, there's so many of us. This is not a competition of spiritual growth. This is not about us racking up points. This is not about us getting status. You're already clean because of the word he's spoken. So if you're already clean and you're already righteous and you're already holy and you're already blameless, good works, why even be about them? Bearing fruit, why even care? I guess here's what I've discovered. There's nothing better. And man, it feels good. Doesn't it feel good to love somebody? Doesn't it feel good to be generous? Doesn't it feel good to share the heart of God with other people? Doesn't it feel amazing to fulfill your calling? I mean, if you've been redesigned from the ground up and you've got the Christ connection, you're fused, you're merged, you're bonded, it feels really good. And I use the word feel loosely. I mean, our feelings could be all over the place, but I'm saying there's a satisfaction and there's a fulfillment there that is off the charts. There's no, there's no better life. I mean, the deception is, is that the world is living it up. Have you ever tried that? The world is living it up. 
man, they're having so much fun, they're having a ball, and I'm just going to go out there for a little while. I'll just take five years, ten years. I'm just going to play around a little while because the world has really got it, and then I'll come back and I'll be serious. How'd that work for you? I mean, what we discover is the whole thing's upside down. God has the good food. The world is starving. Sometimes they're eating poison. They're getting sick. It's no good for you. And the Father is the one lifting us up and cleaning and pruning and taking care. And then we're saying, yeah, but could I go over there to the weeds? So when we get a healthy perspective, man, we start seeing God is good and that He cares and that He's not holding back. He's not withholding. I mean, I used to think, you know, sin is so great. Here it is. Sin is amazing. You're going to love it, but you better not do it because you're a Christian. And there's church people that might see you do it. And you grew up in a good home, too. You don't want to ruin your reputation. But boy, if you could, man, but you better not. You see, that's, that's a baby version of sin. That's baby talk. And what we see here is adult talk, mature talk. The talk that is real. I mean, God is saying, I take care of you. I lead you to the, to the perfect life in the perfect way with healthy food so that you can eat good food and live and breathe well. And experience health. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit. And so you prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Wow. So, again, how loved are you? Well, Jesus has drawn a parallel that would almost seem like heresy. It's not heresy because we shout things like, God loves you, uh, for God so loved the world, John 3.16. We see that on camera in the stadiums. I mean, we've almost grown uh, uh, immune to the idea that God loves us. But what is almost heretical or should be a a, a real head turner here is that God is saying the same love that I love Jesus with I love you with. So you've got Jesus quality love. You've got Jesus quality approval. I think I need to use some other words for it to penetrate. It's almost like we're numb to the word love because we've sort of made, well, God loves everybody. God is nice. God loves everybody. But you've got Jesus level approval. You've got Jesus level acceptance. You've got Jesus level closeness. You've got Jesus-level cleanness. God likes you. He knows what He got, and He likes you. I wonder, does, Jesus, does God like you as much as He likes Jesus? I'm talking like, you know? Does He like you as much as He likes Jesus? Maybe that's what we need to go out of here with, the question that we need to answer. Does God like me as much as He likes Jesus? Because love, again, it can be innocuous. It's a good word, it's a Bible word, but maybe we've grown numb to it. Just as the Father has liked me, I have also liked you. It's pretty cool, huh? Abide in my like, (laughs) live in my like. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You say, "Uh uh-oh, commandments, Uh uh-oh, now we're back to the law, Moses, 613 commands, well, Fortunately, two verses later, he announces what his commandments involve. And they involve love. Love others even as I have loved you. In fact, this same apostle John is the author of 1 John. And you know what he says about Jesus' commandments? He says this, His commandments are not burdensome. These are his commandments to believe in Jesus and love others even as He has loved us. So it's amazing how many people will call into the radio program or write us an email. Anytime they see the word commandments, they think of Moses. And so then we end up in like a double talk. I'm dead to the law, but got to watch out for those commandments. Christ is the end of the law, but there's still those commandments. I'm not under the law, but apparently there's His commands. 
And so we end up with this dichotomy. We're trying to resolve it. And it's so simple. The commands are what Jesus writes on your heart. Believe and love and believe and love. And so why would he say, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love? He, he's saying, if you love others, even as I've loved you, then you will be living in my love. And still, they're like, what? What are you talking about? Peter doesn't understand. Philip has expressed concern. Thomas is outright doubting. They don't get it. But there's going to be a day when they live in His love and they keep His commandments. You will keep my commandments, another passage says. You will keep them. In other words, instinct at your core. You will instinctively love other believers. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. I, I hope you see the purpose of everything Jesus has taught. He wants you to get excited. That His joy would be in us. That we would be excited. For a lot of Christians, their faith is a headache. For a lot of believers, our faith has been disappointing. I mean, can we be honest? It was very exciting during that first week. We grew up as a Christian in a Christian home. We learned all the Bible stories and we learned about what Jesus did for us. We received him into our hearts. And man, that was exciting. And then something happened. I don't know if it was the campfire where you wrote down all your sins and tossed them in. And then you decided that was a ritual mentally that needed to take place. I don't know if it was a pep rally where you were told to come down front and try harder this week. I don't know if it was a book you read or messages you heard that sort of mixed everything together and law and grace became this ball of confusion. But somewhere the joy got stolen. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Somehow the joy got stolen. And Jesus has just given us reason to restore the joy. The joy is in us. But do we recognize how free we are? Are you willing to have fun as a Christian is your faith a headache? I was watching a, a message last night. Uh, it was someone I've never seen before. don't know his name. But I clicked on it on YouTube and began to watch this sermon. And the one thing that struck me was this guy. This guy is not having any fun. I mean, this guy doesn't even like what he's saying. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way with your faith? Don't even like what you're believing. Don't even like what you're saying. This doesn't work. I'm going to sales pitch this to that guy. This doesn't even work for me. Jesus presents this so that we can find something authentic. And it's him and us and us and him and bragging on him and never apart from him and always connected to him. You do abide. There's no divide. You do abide. There's no divide. So I hope you've seen today that the vine and the branches has real meaning. Your joy can be made full by what Jesus has shared here. The vine and branches has real meaning. The Christ connection is real. Abide is not a work. You don't strive to abide. You live in Christ, period. So you do abide and there's no divide. You're never apart from Him. I guess I would ask, what if we, as the body of Jesus Christ, began to really see this? We would stop begging for what we already have. We would see our connection with Christ, and we would see our connection with each other a whole lot better. We would operate not trying to get and hope and wait and plead and beg for some sort of connection, trying to get clean and get close, we would operate as clean and close people. You know, how many times have you found yourself saying, I wish I was Christ-like? You ever heard that? I grew up hearing that all the time. I wish I was Christ-like. Man, I, 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 I need to be more Christ-like. In high school, that was the thing. I would sit in a chapel service and I would hear a hundred times a year that I need to be Christ-like. You know what that assumes? I'm not Christ-like. I'm not. But I need to get somewhere that I'm not. And I, I understand that sometimes we're talking about attitudes and actions. 
But do you see the vine and the branches has made you Christ-like? We are like Him at the core. Him and us and us and Him. What if the church knew this? What if we stopped trying to be Christ-like and recognize we are Christ-like? What if we stopped trying to be dead to sin and instead counting ourselves dead to sin? What if you started counting yourself alive and connected? So we belong and we have an intuitive knowing of Jesus and the connection is real and Jesus is our everything. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the vine and branches. We thank you for this analogy Honestly, some of us, maybe for a long time, we didn't get it. We, we read cut off. We thought we were going to be cut off. We read burned. We thought we might be burned. We read abide, and we tried to wake up and somehow abide more. We got it wrong. But we thank you that the truth always sets us free. We thank you that we do live in you, and you do live in us, and you're not with us every day trying to live, you do live. We're not trying to live, we do live in you. We thank you for this beautiful union, that closeness is a gift, that Jesus prayed for it, that his prayer came true, that the vine and branches is real. We are fused and bonded to you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.